Uh, the goal is to gain some insight from deans and faculty at schools who are working with liberal arts colleges uh, through uh, dual degree programs, through graduate programs, through a variety of entries, um, and help us understand how our liberal arts students can best um, connect to these universities um, and how we can best support and advise our own students to be most successful in trying to make those leaps and maybe provide some cautionary tales as well when we're thinking about it. Um, we have give, we have a, this luxury of a small gathering, we can have this whole group discussion, but we also have a member who's Skyping in, which could make things a little awkward, so um, ironically with engineering, we also have to roll with the punches of technology being a highly imperfect um, situation here. So thank you for your patience, but that's why I might moderate a little more than otherwise, is to make sure um, everyone, all the panelists um, are equally able to contribute. Um, so, to start, I want to um, introduce our panelists. So, Alex Hartoff is a research professor of engineering at Dartmouth, um, focused in biomedical engineering with an emphasis on medical imaging. His current research includes electrical impedance imaging for breast and prostate cancer screening. Um, and just one of the many things he's done is taught an electronics for musicians course, which sounded relevant to thinking about some of the courses we've talked about. Uh, and he also served for four years as the director of the MS and PhD programs at the Thayer School of Engineering at Dartmouth. Uh, Ron Lau, Lowey, Lowey, excuse me, has served as the director of engineering of the engineering dual degree program, which is a 3-2 at Washington University in St. Louis since 2011. His interests include the process of leveraging key value-added skills from a liberal education, such as creativity, communication, and lateral thinking, to an engineering curriculum. Finally, Paul Stajkowski is the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs at University of Minnesota. He is a Morse alumni professor and is the recipient of a number of teaching awards. His research examines both the fundamental physics and applied fluid, fluid mechanics of non-reacting and reacting free shear flows. So thank you all very much for being here. Uh, to start, I wanted to um, think about how there's, each of these schools has very different relationships with um, liberal arts colleges in terms of Washington University having, um, I'd say, a relatively classical and very successful 3-2 model, and Minnesota needing to transition their model, um, and Dartmouth, oh no. <laughs> um, oh, good. Um, Dartmouth having a 2111. I don't know what you refer to it um, at Dartmouth, but that's well, what we, we actually refer to it as the 3-2 program, like you just did. Okay. I'm not aware of any other designation. Okay, but but it is that you start with two years at your home institution, a year there, a year at back. Uh, they are actually year. flexible, but generally that's what you, students gotcha. choose to do best. So, so there's some different models here that I think is interesting to explore. Um, and to start off the conversation, I thought that we've been talking a lot about our relationships to your universities and colleges, and perhaps you could talk a bit about how you see your relationship to liberal arts colleges and liberal arts students, and then everyone in the audience, please come with questions, but I know you will have many of, um, since the, I have a bunch of questions, but I want to make it a more of a discussion. So, but to start your relationship to us. Can we do that? Sure. Okay, yeah. sure. So, um, in terms of... Washington University and St. Louis, our relationship to you. Washington University has had the engineering dual degree program for over 40 years. It is not an afterthought at Washington University. We have very much valued the quality of students that come from the small liberal arts colleges to our community, uh, to our engineering community, and quite frankly, they do very well um, for colleges, for small liberal arts schools that we have an affiliation with. Uh, we have an affiliation with currently 96 um, affiliated schools, and we find that after spending three or four years at a small liberal arts school, our engineering students come in and they're very pragmatic. They, they know what they, they want, they know that they want uh, the engineering degree, but they also come with that level of uh, creativity, good writing skills, uh, good communication skills, that really fit well with the philosophy for um, Washington University in St. Louis and what, and what we're doing. So in that respect, with the community and the type of engineering program we have, 
we certainly want to make sure that it's a, a good fit for the student, <clears throat> something that the, ultimately the student is going to uh, benefit from starting at a small uh, liberal arts school and coming to Washington University. Uh, let me just mention, yes, we do call these 3-2 programs, and I will answer if it's called a, if someone says your 3-2 program, but we have a lot of different options where students sometimes will spend three years or four years at a small liberal arts school. Oftentimes they might be involved in a student organization, a club, or a sport where they don't want to leave after three years. We also have an option where a student can spend an extra year and get a master's degree as well. Undergraduate ABET accredited degree, stay an extra year, get a master's in engineering degree. So different options of how students might want to do it at Washington University depending on uh, their interests. Let's stop there. Okay. Uh, yeah. So at the university, I guess the, the, the main point I want to make, and I'll repeat at the end, is we need a liberal education background more than ever in engineering. Everything that we tell our students is that they are here to impact the human experience. Uh, and it is uh, actually, it turns out, um, <laughs> so the relationship we've had with McAllister is changing a little bit, although technically not a lot. So one of the things that we have suffered from is that students from our own College of Liberal Arts desperately want to join our programs as well. So we had had over the years many, we called them 3-2, and then about a decade ago we chose to call them dual degree because they were more like 3-3. Three, three. We always have had, and I think Ron would agree to this, that you have to have that conversation with students about, uh, I, for instance, in mechanical engineering, uh, I love to have students with four-year programs in physics or chemistry. In fact, we are hiring more faculty in mechanical engineering. Well, four out of the last five were not engineers. Uh, uh, and we have a conversation. We also, so, so our relationship is that we, we have to, when, when we entered into these dual degree three, two, we would guarantee admission to students from excellent programs. And this state has plenty of them. We're very, very fortunate. Um, but we were turning down students from our own College of Liberal Arts with like a 3.5 GPA, taking students from other schools, some from the evil empire of Wisconsin, no less. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and so we had to really sort of balance it. So now we are working very hard, we are very much encouraging of, of the transition. But one conversation we have, whether it's with the, any of our students, is don't just throw engineering at the end of everything. There's this tendency for stu students know math, chemistry, and physics, and other things for sure. And sort of this, a STEM underpinning is sort of where these students end up starting from. And they like to throw engineering at the end because they somehow think it's going to pay better, or it's going to somehow it sounds cooler, it's going to get a job. And actually, we force them not to talk about their degrees. It's not about degrees. It, 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 they can, there's a wonderful visual that you'll find on the, um, the Census Bureau I've never seen. It looks like an eyeball. And you can hover over it. It's beautiful. Yeah. You all should look at it. Have you seen it? It's just spectacular. You can hover over engineering, and you'll see where engineering graduates go. Only half of all engineering graduates go into technical fields. You can hover over healthcare and see in healthcare where people come to healthcare. Only half come from the biological sciences. The types of teams that our students work with from, from Boston Scientific aren't six biomedical engineers. It might be a biologist, a statistician, a psychologist, a business person, and an engineer. So, it, so the liberal underpinning is absolutely critical. I wish I could make AP go away. Not because I'm against quality AP, but I'm against the fact that too many of our students come, they're sort of done with that. And then it's just all technical, and that's an absolute mistake. Like, come on, but start there. I guess it's my turn to speak? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, I did not have a formal uh, uh, talk prepared, but I can give you a sense of uh, how we look at the uh, relationship, if you will, between typical liberal arts uh, students, and I, I should emphasize that although we do have an engineering school, and I'm, I'm part of it, as you know, uh, at Dartmouth, Dartmouth is still considered a liberal arts school primarily, uh, and we cater to liberal arts students as a matter of uh, everyday business, if you will, and uh, one way in which we um, function, if you will, within Dartmouth is that we provide a range of courses that are um, targeted to fulfill their requirements for technology and applied sciences. And so we have a number of courses that have no 
uh, prerequisites, meaning that you don't have to have had calculus or anything like that, but which are technological in nature, such as image processing or other digital imaging, such as uh, the science and engineering of music, such as uh, engineering in sports, which are designed to elicit, uh, first of all, an interest in engineering and technology among the students, and uh, secondly, possibly, uh, talk some of the students into actually majoring in engineering, but we don't tell them that. Uh, uh, the uh, other way in which we function, which is uh, uh, this first uh, 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 aspect of our, of our operation, is that we essentially work as the engineering department within Dartmouth, but we also operate as, uh, you may say, a freestanding graduate program in engineering, and we recruit ourselves uh, masters and PhD level students, and of course, uh, one of our uh, uh, places to recruit students is from our own graduates. So we have a pretty good sense of what we can expect from students who may not have had necessarily the full complement of engineering education, but who express an interest in doing a, um, a graduate uh, a level uh, program in uh, engineering. Uh, but before I get into that, I should mention that um, uh, we um, um, have two uh, uh, undergraduate degrees uh, at uh, Thayer for um, uh, students interested in engineering. And one is AD, which means that the students have fulfilled all the requirements for the uh, typical Dartmouth AD degree, except that the major is in engineering. But that is not a um, accredited engineering degree. Uh, with, uh, by spending an additional year in the uh, engineering school, they can uh, complete the course requirements and the project requirements that will give them a ABET accredited engineering degree. So I wanted to make the distinction between our AB program, which is, you may say, a liberal arts degree in engineering, and I know it sounds a little funny, and the uh, BE degree, which is a uh, fully accredited engineering degree. And then, of course, we have the graduate programs, uh, of which uh, I was the director until last year this time. Uh, and uh, it is not unusual for us because our program um, um, uh, selection uh, of students is based largely on the uh, expressed wishes of the faculty that we will enroll folks who are not engineering uh, students uh, in their backgrounds. Uh, mostly those are students from the sciences, such as physics, chemistry, and so on. Uh, but it has happened in the past, uh, not infrequently, that we would recruit students who show uh, a lot of promise who did not graduate from uh, uh, the hard sciences. In fact, uh, the, the, the person I introduced today to one of the seminars that uh, uh, I was uh, uh, supposed to attend and that I'm uh, building out on right now, is now a neurosurgeon who went through the uh, MD-PhD program here at uh, Dartmouth and did his PhD in engineering. Uh, but when he came to Dartmouth, he was a uh, historic history and philosophy major uh, who um, agreed to take a few additional courses uh, while here at Dartmouth. Uh, so as to be able to be admitted in the engineering program for the MD-PhD program. So, we are in, in some sense fairly flexible in that uh, uh, requirements are what they are, but if we see uh, somebody who's talented, we uh, are willing to accommodate that. Um, and I think that this is uh, 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 the, the benefit of being a relatively small school, uh, that we can be flexible. Uh, and the other message that I would like to convey through that is that uh, one does not have to have an engineering background to pursue a uh, degree in engineering at the MS or PhD level. Uh, one needs to be willing to work uh, pretty hard, I suppose, but that's, uh, that's obvious no matter what. Wonderful. Any first questions or should I jump in? Yeah, you can Alright, um, I'm curious about uh, advising students who want to be engineers, maybe the, the dual degree programs that they're aware of or that this, we offer at our schools are not a good fit for a variety of reasons, for not wanting to leave your home institution, for not being able to afford 
another year or two of undergraduate education. Um, do you have any thoughts about how to advise those students um, major in physics? Should they be doing corporate internships? Should they be doing academic research through REUs? What, what, are your, what is your advice to help those students be as competitive as possible? Uh, yeah, I'm going to try. I'm watching me very linear here. Uh, um, well, we uh, I think in my 30 years at the U, we were very impersonal 10 years ago and before. And I think schools like McAllister and St. Olaf and others have upped our game a lot in terms of holistic advising and these sorts of things. So there's not a single answer. Um, wherever they go out of high school, that's sort of the starting point, it has to, be, it has to feel right. They have to feel like this is a good fit for them. Uh, I, I do remind them that they have to leave their institution. That This is, could be painful. I went through it with my daughter who wanted uh, to go to a, a liberal arts college and then thought, well, maybe I'll, if I change my mind, I'll be a biomedical engineer or something. Well, honey, you're going to have to leave your school. <laughs> yeah, well, that could suck. You know, so this sort of the holistic picture, I, I do think that if you, if you provide holistic advising, meaning that you have students get connected with professional academic advisors and faculty and can continuously through their education, so they come back and talk about study abroad and those kind of things, I do think that, um, I believe staying at one institution is a better idea. I, re I really fundamentally do. I, I would highly encourage your students that are interested in engineering to finish their degree here and then get a master's degree. I completely agree with that. I, 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 I mean, it's always come down to really six years often to complete the two degrees and you have a bachelor's, two bachelor's degrees. And the beauty of the bachelor's master's is, yes, the research is paramount. The research is paramount just because it's research. It, it just, it's just fun to work with the faculty, so demystifying the professor, right? Getting them to know the faculty and that this is why we have fun and this empowers them. And it can easily be done by starting with a four-year degree and then going on. And of course, you all know <laughs> that part of it is to remind them that they don't have to pay necessarily for their degrees. We can fund these, these degrees. So this is something that many students who aren't in the sciences, and many students in the sciences don't know, that they can get a full, full rise, essentially, uh, or co combining with TA ships and things like that. It, 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 uh, I, I don't want to interrupt anyone, but uh, um, you just uh, hit on an important note. Uh, we do, uh, uh, as a faculty in general, are assigned a number of undergraduate students to be um, our advisees, uh, students who have expressed an interest in, uh, in the sciences. And my um, uh, biggest recommendation to them is always to take advantage of opportunities that are offered to conduct research. There are a number of fellowships that are offered that uh, support them for either summer or part-time work in a lab. And uh, that, in my personal experience, has been the source of a number of recruitments of brilliant students who did very well in my research uh, lab. And so I always recommend that very strongly. And also to uh, uh, get to the point that was just made, I like to tell the students that uh, getting an MS or a PhD in the sciences is generally a free ride. It definitely is in engineering. And so that's an important consideration. Now, once you've finished your um, a, B, or B, E, there will be no tuition bills, and that usually percolates <laughs> uh, with that. So I think this question is a great example of the need to know where the student is and what their interests are, and asking them the right questions with what route they want to choose. I mean, certainly those who are interested in engineering, and if they attend Washington University in St. Louis, most of them are, are physics majors, but I have seen every single major, certainly math, computer science, economics, music majors, as long as they can fit all the requirements and they can do a level of the rigor required in, in the math courses and the physics courses in order to be successful in engineering. So that's one piece of it. The interesting aspect um, about how to advise them and whether to go into masters or I think a question I heard last night is, what's the value of getting two bachelor's degrees? Why get an undergraduate for your liberal arts school in physics and then the the bachelor's degree uh, that is still an undergraduate degree and certainly one of the answers is that uh, the undergraduate bachelor's degree in engineering comes with the ABET accreditation in most cases and we can talk about that more if people are interested in exactly what that 
uh, means? That's a whole other complicated question. Is it necessary? Is it not necessary? We can certainly talk um, about that. But I would also advocate a little bit on the richness that occurs at the undergraduate level with engineering from the problem solving aspect and the collaboration aspect. And this is one of my biggest points. What can you do as advisors uh, to your students who are interested in engineering? The great thing about a small liberal arts college is the ability to collaborate. The small class size, often residential communities, so it's natural that students are going to be collaborating together. The more that they can end up problem solving, and certainly problem solving with those outside of engineering, as we learn, they are going to be collaborating with the rest of their life with non-engineers. That stereotype of the old engineer who just wears a white coat and is alone, and, um, that, that is not the case more and more. So I think that kind of collaboration can, can really help. And I, I will often say, it, I've, I've tried to not sound like a Washington University commercial in this presentation, but I, I do feel very strongly that, that um, we have a great thing going with our community. Um, at Washington University, you can stay an extra year and do a master's degree. You can get three degrees in six years. It's called the 3-3 program. So it'd be an example, you have three years at McAllister, uh, two years for your undergraduate bachelor's degree, one extra year for the master's degree. You do the whole thing in, in six years, and it gives you the opportunity. Sometimes as a graduate student, you may not be fully engaged in the community. Sometimes other graduate students are not fully engaged in the undergraduate experience. Washington University is also um, a residential community. They're kind of used to that, and that kind of collaboration gets a little bit more, more natural at that level. Can I have a follow-up question? I really, since I'm not, my school doesn't participate in the 3-2 program, or does it need to, but I'm interested in the economics of it from the point of view of the student. Is the student, you mentioned that for the masters, and I do know this, that our students usually don't have to pay for their masters or PhDs because they are assistants or they work on grants. But I'm not sure about how the 3-2 program works. Does the students actually have to pay for a fifth year or a sixth year out of pocket, or do they uh, get uh, assistantships, or how, do, how does that work? I'd, I'd be interested in it. Well, certainly in our program, which is, is sort of dissolving in some sense, um, you, you're going to pay. Um, a fifth year? You, you're going to pay. Year. Well, you're going to pay six years, basically. It's pretty difficult, even if you, you really lean heavy on the core math, chemistry, physics, to finish our engineering degrees. I hate to say it, you can do it in five total, three plus two, but it's the majority of students always were three plus three. So it, it, you know, it's for sure, it, it, and we don't really hire undergraduate teaching assistants very often, so it's not a lot of opportunity. Certainly our internships and co-ops are a lot of things you can add that would help finance education, but. Um, uh, yeah, well, I, I guess the, the quick answer is it depends, but it will, you, you should tell your students the financial aid models are different. Uh, often students will call and say, I have this scholarship at Grinnell, or what have you. Does that carry over? I have this financial aid. And really, often it's comparable if you have a certain financial aid model uh, at your small liberal arts school. It, it usually is uh, comparable to what you might get at Washington University. You would apply for the financial aid. At the graduate level, our three-year graduate option, that is a completely different model because we can fund that ourselves through uh, the School of Engineering. Uh, they get 50% off the first year, 55% off the second year, 60% off the graduate year. Those who are um, uh, liaison officers, we call that our graduate affiliation scholarship. You may be familiar with it. And then there's other merit-based scholarships as well. You should tell them that once you apply, you get what your financial aid model is for both options. And before you pay anything, then you decide if you can afford it or if you want uh, to do it. So it's not completely clear cut, but at least they'll see their options before they sign on the dotted line. Alex, yeah. Uh, if, if I may interject here, um, in the way our uh, uh, B program is set up, typically we take a fifth year to complete, and uh, that would be on the student's uh, dime, obviously unless there is some uh, financial assistance arrangement. However, uh, students who are willing to uh, get organized early on uh, can complete the program in four years. It is uh, realizable, it's a lot of work of course, but it is doable and in fact, uh, the statistics we have is that uh, nearly 40% of our B students do the program in four years. And so from the financial point of view, 
uh, you get a fifth year for free, you might say, or you get an engineering degree for the uh, price of uh, your AB, I suppose. So, not to uh, dominate this, but what's the advantage to the student not just to go for four years, either pay for four years or get financial aid for four years, and then uh, find a, a master's or PhD program that you're going to be funded by your professor, your advisor, and not have to pay, it sounds like it would be the same. I mean, uh, you're asking me? I'm asking, yes, I guess. Okay, well I can handle uh, that part from here. The, uh, the primary distinction is that of a accredited engineering degree versus a uh, AB in a, uh, engineering, which uh, uh, in some uh, uh, instances does not carry the same, um, uh, how would you say, a credit, if you will, on the job market. Uh, but other than that, you are correct, and some of our AB students do manage to get into PhD programs elsewhere, so it is definitely for the students to uh, think that through. And what you can get into. PhD programs often might be harder to get into if you're interested in different things. That would be the other aspect as well. Could you comment how many, what percentage of your students are women that go on to the uh, BS degree? Do you hear me? Yes, so, so the question was what percentage of students are women who go on to the BS degree? Is that right, Larry? Yeah. We have about 30% uh, of our dual degree students and who started. I was asking Dartmouth. Oh, sorry. Did uh, you hear? Were you asking me? Yes. Uh, I'm having a little difficult time of uh, figuring out who is being uh, addressed. Uh, uh, at the undergraduate level, our um, uh, ratio of male to female, I believe, is uh, we have uh, close to 40% uh, females in the engineering undergraduate program. Um, I don't recall what the figures at the PhD level are. They're a little bit lower. Uh, we're hoping to achieve parity sometime in the future. We're working on it. Uh, that's all I can say. Tim, I said Yeah, I just had a quick question for a couple of you, um, including you, Alex, about uh, funding the, the graduate education, particularly at the master's level, because typically that's done with a TA, with a teaching assistantship. But there's a mismatch if, you're, if you come with a physics degree and now you're going to be in an electrical, electrical engineering department. Can you serve as a TA, or does it have to be an RA? How do, how do you okay. handle that? Uh, that? That's easy enough. Uh, we don't have departments, first of all. So you come in and you get uh, degrees in engineering sciences, not in electrical or mechanical or anything like that. Obviously, what you do for your thesis project will designate what your uh, orientation is, so to speak, in the uh, context of engineering. Uh, the the uh, financing of the whole program is based on uh, individual faculty research uh, money. Basically, faculty recruit students either as PhD students or as MS students to work on their projects. Uh, the typical uh, arrangement is that uh, projects that have a long horizon will call for PhD students, typical R1 from NIH being about four or five years. That is uh, how PhD students are supported, and smaller projects funded through other mechanisms may call for a one or two year involvement on the part of an MS student. And the advisor, who is the PI on the various project, essentially puts the bill at the Thayer School. That's the arrangement that we have. How about at Washington and Minnesota? So Washington University, uh, we do have we do have departments first of all. So you do go into a specific uh, major, mechanical, electrical, uh, chemical, and so on and so forth. Uh, usually TA positions are not done uh, the the first year, but they are applied for. Uh, they're possible and they they vary. But students would apply for a TA position or other work study opportunities or working in the calculus help room for other undergrads. Different different opportunities available. So again, we're probably parochial. <laughs> Uh, in that we, we have a nice program where we have a dual master's, bachelor's degree at our own school. So if you are an undergrad and mechanical, you can go into the grad program in your third year, work simultaneously on both degrees, uh, pay undergrad tuition through your master's, and also get TA shifts as an undergrad, but because you're technically also a graduate student. So, um, and for us, uh, you know, you wouldn't, if you came from McAllister after three years, you. I mean, uh, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you could find a faculty member who might be teaching nanotechnology or something that, that a physics student could really jump into, but for the most part, I think TA ships would be problematic. Um, 
uh, at that stage. So I wonder if you would uh, comment on the, the experience or the success of students in your graduate program who have come there directly with an undergraduate degree, not in engineering, from a liberal arts college. I mean, do they work out well? I mean, do you do you like them as well as you like students that have come with a degree in engineering? Is there a culture shock they have to overcome? And if so, what could they do as undergraduates to lessen that? I mean, did they fit in, I guess is what I'm saying. I think they've been marvelously. In fact, our faculty wish our own students were better in the core subjects. And this happens partly because our students, uh, unfortunately, are getting through calculus in high school. So they're done with math. Yeah. And so then, then they go two years at the U uh, or wherever, and they don't do math, really, in a sense. And then the junior year comes along, and we have to use math again. And they go, well, we don't do math. Yeah. You know, we're done with that. So uh, I mean, f f engineering is just an application of these things. That's all it is. So I mean. The sciences or the humanities, and sometimes you're, you're taking the knowledge of the universe and bringing it in here. And then as engineers, we take what's here and we go out there with it. So it's like sort of a continuum. But uh, I've had great success myself, mostly in physics. I'm more of a fluid physics guy, I like flow in a nasal passageway or whatever. So yeah, I need, uh, we have to understand the physics. So I, for me, it's great. Well, I, I would say that I don't think I have a general rule that. Uh, that um, uh, will compare uh, non-engineering to uh, other students in how they succeeded. Uh, you, you have, and I'm speaking here for the whole school, not just for my uh, uh, students. Uh, but you have to understand that our recruitment is uh, entirely driven by faculty um, uh, needs. And so faculty who will go out on a limb to recruit someone who is not an engineering major usually do so either because they have very good reason to believe that this is a very talented person or that uh, their non-engineering background is very suitable for what they're doing. For example, physics background in electromagnetics um, and that sort of thing. So uh, if you take that into account, uh, I uh, have anecdotal evidence that uh, many of the non-hard sciences students who eventually made it into our uh, MS or PhD program did very well. Uh, combination of uh, astute recruiting, I would say, with uh, the willingness on the part of the Thayer School to give them the uh, preparation, if you will, so that they will succeed in their engineering courses. So a little bit, a bit of accommodation uh, on the front end, and you have some very good results at the uh, at the back end. And, and my information is rather anecdotal as, as well. We have a very small end of students who come from, say, our affiliated schools who go straight into the master's program and don't go into the dual degree program. Um, every indication of those students have done that, have done very well, and I think that probably the, the faculty do a very good job of vetting those. That is a completely separate admissions process than our dual degree program, and I think we have so many more from our affiliated schools who do the master's via the dual degree program because of the better financial aid package and because of the relationship we have with the schools. It's, it's a little less, maybe a little bit less of a risk. They say, I've done all these requirements. There's this affiliation there. If my faculty member says that I'm the kind of student that would be successful at Washington University in St. Louis, I believe I will, and they go that route uh, more often than they would um, doing the straight master's route. So how many students a year come into your dual degree program? Last year we had 70. This year we have broken a record. After hearing what's going on in Columbia and a little bit of Minnesota, I realized why. We have 96 <laughs> students who have uh, deposited. Uh, we're not uh, trying to grow necessarily. We want the quality students, but, but we are uh, getting bigger. Is there a maximum? We hope not. They are a little angry at me right now, uh, but we have a special agreement with housing, and so far there has not uh, been a maximum. You never, you never know, but I, right now we're okay. One quantitative point on it is we do notice that the, particularly the physics students who, who are in the PhD program and take the oral exam, it's a, it's a bit of a struggle because sometimes the jargon I mean, it's obviously, obviously a stressful situation anyway. You're sort of up at a board and you're being asked questions. And sometimes the engineering jargon doesn't, doesn't catch quite, 
quite right away. And so they were ultimately successful, but sometimes it's a bit more painful. They might do a retake when they prep for their exams. Okay. Um, given that interest nationwide seems to be increasing in engineering, do you expect that uh, over the next several years we can expect it to be harder and harder for students from liberal arts colleges to get into the three two programs at your institution. Well, well <laughs> yeah, I, so we don't have a three two, but I mean, we, we love students from liberal arts programs. The problem is we all are seeing it, and partly it's the proliferation of, of online uh, application processes. For our freshman class, we have a thousand slots, and this year we had fourteen thousand applicants. So um, it's. Uh, it, the demand is, is, is sort of ridiculous right now. So the advantage, though, I think, of 3, 2, and dual and coming in later is you don't know what a freshman wants. You don't, and you, you can't expect them to know what they want. So you have to let the exploration go. So as a freshman, I, I can't say, well, I'm going to be able to take this many because they are interested in chemical engineering because they're, they're not. They don't know this. However, the student that comes in a bit later, although the dual degree is a little more problematic because they haven't had engineering exposure, that we bring in transfer students in a larger number because we can, we, ah, electrical engineering this year has space, so we can take differentially, so we can be much more, we can fill the bin sort of more efficiently because the programs have different demand curves depending on what, what's going on. Right now, energy and the environment, and, you know, global, grand challenges, very, very popular kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I, 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 well, even in the state of Minnesota, right, when I started the U, we were the only engineering program. Now there are six in the state, so they, they, they do grow. Uh, I, I can address that question, too. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay, sorry. Um, um, uh, regarding the uh, uh, difficulty of entering one of those uh, transition programs or dual degree programs, uh, our limitation, it seems like uh, elsewhere, is what the college will allow us to take in. Uh, we are limiting the program to 25 uh, students uh, uh, currently because that's the number of uh, 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 spots there is in the dorms that uh, will be reserved for us and we can't take more. Uh, but we are um, in the process of expanding physically the uh, Thayer School and uh, we expect that the program will grow. So. Uh, whether it will get more difficult or not, I can't really say, but they, uh, my expectation is that there will be more spots for liberal arts students who would like to complete the dual degree uh, in one of the schools that we are affiliated with, and I believe there are 27 of them uh, uh, that are 3D uh, programs with uh, Dartmouth. Ron, sure. Care. Well, it, it's, a, it's a great question. I, I guess my answer is I hope it doesn't get limited at Washington University in St. Louis, but we are seeing our numbers increasingly. Uh, they are going up, um, and no one has, has told us to, to cut back on it, although I will say there was a time where when someone didn't meet the minimum average of the requirements to, to get in, we were maybe a little, a little bit more relaxed a couple years ago than we are now. So uh, I guess that is some good advice. Uh, students do need to show a very uh, strong academic record in, in physics and, and calculus and other things uh, as well. Uh, we're a little bit unique in the sense that the School of Engineering at Washington University of St. Louis runs the dual degree program. The admissions process is out of something called Engineering Student Services, which is my office. You don't apply with a common application. This often confuses students. This is how we get to know students right away from when they start, and then those who are visiting the campuses become their advisor and they are there until they walk across the stage at, at graduation. So we have a little bit more control over how many we can take as long as we uh, don't frust frustrate the departments too much if, if there's too many in uh, Mechanics 1 or, or that sort of thing. Uh, we have recently built some new buildings, so so far we're okay, um, but no guarantees. So I wanted to uh, ask about the difference between the Two one 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 programs and the three two programs. So I'm from Middlebury, and and we have a fair number of students, three four five a year, who go to Dartmouth, and it seems to mesh very well for them to go over there. Their junior year, graduate with their friends, the fourth year go back, the fifth year, and I'm not sure if there are any other programs like that, and if they're the popularity of these programs is at all tied to the structure. 
Uh, speaking for the program at Dartmouth, as I mentioned earlier, we have a suggested uh, a standard format, which you just described very well. Uh, but otherwise, we are quite accommodating, and if students wanted to do uh, that in any other uh, sequence, it can be arranged. Uh, we were not uh, dogmatic about that. Yeah, you know, here, here's the interesting thing. Um, I have had several students come to me and say, Dartmouth does it like this. Can I do that, that at Washington University? And we have told them, Yes, you, you can. We can. You would just simply take, you could do a one one one, take a leave of absence. But then I tell them, you need to understand, you know how important it is, because you want to graduate with your maybe friends at Dartmouth. Well, here's the thing. When you come to Washington University, boy, do you get ingrained in that community right away. And you meet those other students, and you collaborate. Uh, our housing, the students live together. Well, you are going to have your study group. And then if you leave that second year to go back to Dartmouth, and then return, or back to you know, your school, and then you return to Washington University, everyone who you built that relationship with uh, will be moved, have moved on. So I've never had a taker who've done it, because after they realize, uh, you know, this, when you come to Washington University in St. Louis, you really get ingrained in the community, and I don't want to lose that by leaving for a year. I haven't had anyone do it, but if anyone wants to, they would be my, my first experiment of how it works. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Am I right in thinking that there are financial aid um, ramifications of doing a 3-2 versus a 2-1-1? One, one. So if one receives, once one receives the initial baccalaureate degree, then my impression was that certain federal forms of aid mm -hmm. disappear, and as that long, was an advantage of a 3-2? As three, long as you two? don't get two BSs or two oh. BAs. If you get a B, so our engineering degrees are Bachelor of Engineering degrees. They're not BS degrees. Mm -hmm. So our students can get a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry and a Bachelor of Engineering in Chemical Engineering. And they'll still only get the four years equivalent of aid, but they can, they can, they're not locked out of the system. You can't get two BAs or two BSs, but you can get six engineering degrees. The, the, the situation is similar here where we have uh, uh, AB degree in engineering, which is a non-accredited degree, as I, I mentioned earlier, and the BE, which is the accredited degree. And apparently, the difference is significant in in, in the sense of uh, there not being competing degrees as far as the financial degrees, uh, financial uh, assistance is concerned. Well, that that said, um, I know that with Dartmouth, we've had problems because. Um, at least for the first year at Dartmouth, students could not receive financial aid. The expectation was is that the, the liberal arts institution would pay for that year, um, and Carleton's not willing to, to do that. And so um, it, is this an issue with the 3-1-1 or 2-1-1-1 programs, or is it just the way that Dartmouth is set up? Uh, I, I have to apologize, but I am not uh, as uh, acquainted with the fine points of uh, financial assistance uh, for undergraduates as I should probably be for being on the panel. Uh, I was uh, and always have been mostly involved with these students here, uh, and we tend to be very provincial at the State School of Engineering. We don't talk to the folks in the about these things, so I, I don't really know the answer to that. So Ron, can you? We, we have both 3 2 and 2 one, one, one students go to Dartmouth, and it's identical from our perspective. Okay, like it's, not, it's not from Carlton, but Ron, can it, you well, tell if a student were to try to do a. It, it wouldn't be right. It wouldn't have enough. We, they basically would take a leave of absence for a year where they wouldn't be paying um, for when they, they left. I mean, they still would have to. So would they get financial aid? They would. So they could apply for financial aid they, and get financial aid? Yeah, they could apply for financial aid, they could get it, they take a leave of absence. As long as they don't earn a bachelor's degree uh, somewhere, um, then they could continue with that financial aid when they, they come back after that year away. Okay. That's a big difference. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Good point. And just sort of to be clear on a point, because I'm not sure I've made it. Um, so the U brings in 1,000 freshmen to College of Science Engineering. We bring in 500 transfer students. So we're very proud of that. We're very unusual in a Big Ten school that we bring in 
a large number. Of, so we have 1,500 graduates, and only only a, a two thirds come from the from the traditional high school starting point. So we we have about of that 500 that start in the fall as transfer students, about 200 will come from our own College of Liberal Arts. 300 will come from community colleges and in, in, in schools like McAllister. There, that's, that's a large number. It's just we're not promising that if they have a GPA of XYZ here or anywhere else, they get access. The access will depend on the availability at that point in time. But it's a, it's a, it's a very, very viable process. And you could even go there and continue a because we're next door, not true for everybody here. You can do a research project between the two schools. It would be very, very possible. Um, this is a question for Paul. Uh, is access the main reason for the transition uh, that you were talking about, or have there, are there other factors? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. So, as you know, oh, those so? who have had a relationship with us, we got rid of guaranteed admission about five years ago. So we haven't guaranteed any admission to anybody from any of the schools, and we had about 60, uh, mostly in, in the region, so upper Midwest, right? The real true story, I'm pulling being taped, so we'll have to get to the paper gets in the paper, <laughs> uh, is, is that the, our Council on Liberal Education decided, so how the dual degree programs worked is they got a wonderful liberal education degree here, for example. We would say, well, who are we? Obviously, you don't need lib ed from the University of Minnesota. You've got a wonderful undergraduate program in the same. But our College of Liberal Education now says, no. You have to satisfy the University of Minnesota requirements for liberal education. So now, we, when you have that phone call, we don't just say, yeah, you can come on over. We say, well, the, we better have that check because you might need biology with a lab that you didn't have. And I'm looking at my camera. This is probably a financial decision. <laughs> but uh, so that's really what has happened is they uh, we can't guarantee that either now so although most students do satisfy it. when you when you accept a thousand students as um, in their freshman year I'm curious how many end up graduating in engineering and how long does it take does it it's, it's a great question it, it's it's improved tremendously right now our well, again, just, I, the short answer is four-year graduation rate isn't impressive. It's about 65%. Our five-year graduation rate is 80%. Now, but five years isn't necessarily an evil thing. If there are really bad reasons to take five years to get a degree, and there are really good reasons. Our four-year graduation rate for a co-op student is about 29%. Our five-year graduation for a co-op student is 90%. So, uh, and if you do a if you do a dual master's bachelor's, you're not going to graduate in five years or in four years, but you're going to have you go ROTC. You're going to take if you decide study abroad actually reduces time to graduation because it causes the students to plan. Planning has <laughs> amazing <laughs> consequences. Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, I, I uh, now we look at it program by program though. In fact, I just looked this week at every we have 19 majors. I look at grad retention rate for every major different because now we're all at that point where the graduation retention rates are getting to the point where you don't move that line up by looking at some single number. You got to really, and I have to take mechanical, I have to take chemistry, I have to take each program individually and say, well, for civil, I know civil is a great co-op program. It's pretty common for them to take five. There isn't very many good reasons to be taking five in chemistry, unless you're really embedded in research or something, or you're pre preparing for medical school. So that's a conversation. We got to tease out those conversations. But there are wonderful reasons to, to delay. Uh, but so it's 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 a it's not a simple. I mean, I, it's not inexpensive. I'm not, not going to kid you about that. Do you know, of the thousand you accept as freshmen, how many eventually graduate with an engineering degree? I know it. I I know. I know by program, if they, yeah. if they walk in the door and say they want to be an astrophysicist, I can tell you exactly how many graduate in astrophysics, how many graduate with liberal arts. In astrophysics is an example where students, a lot of students want to be astrophysicists until they realize they have to take physics. <laughs> and, whereas, for some reason, students that want to be civil engineers just want to be civil engineers. So, so every field is, 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 is very different, but we look at it program by program by program. And uh, actually, we lose a good chunk of students every year at the College of Liberal Arts for really good reasons. Yeah. Like, it's time not to talk to your parents about everything. What do you want? You know, that kind of conversation <laughs> happens. And, uh, and those aren't bad. And the other thing is that at the U, we have 
BA and BS degrees in the sciences. So you're going to have BA in computer science, physics, math, chemistry, and earth science in the College of Liberal Arts. So it's it, um, so you can move from from mechanical engineering to BA in physics, and you would have left my college. Mm -hmm. So you don't graduate from my college. So I, I I don't get the I don't get credit for that. I mean, until we don't care. I mean, we're happy, but it doesn't it doesn't look necessarily so good. So what is the number? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was successful apparently. <laughs> Uh, right now, this year, we're, our target was for an 80% six-year graduation rate by 2021, and we hit it this year, 80%. I think, too, at U of M, the, a lot of the high schoolers in the state know that the engineering school is the hardest to get into, and they can transfer out, as you said. But if they apply to College of Arts and Sciences, they're, they're, they're there for four years. It, it, it so the better the students hardest. apply to engineering, even if... They yeah, and it's, know that's not what but we mean. actually have pretty good migration. We'll have students in, in the, in that, that, for instance, they'll, they'll want to be biomedical engineers, but then they realize they don't want to be biomedical engineers. Yeah. They want to study yeah. biology, or they want to study biology society and the environment. Those are three different colleges. That they sure, yeah. <laughs> biology society and environment is in liberal arts, and they're exceedingly popular. Yeah. Where yeah. biology and college biological sciences. Okay. It, unfortunately, mm -hmm. complicated. I'm still going to avoid your question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder about the student community on campus. I mean, could students uh, in a liberal arts college within range, for instance, uh, join your student chapter of Engineers Without Borders or, or other organizations? I mean, does this kind of thing happen? Yeah, it does happen. I don't want to... All, all the time. Yeah, it, all, it, all not the a time. problem at all. And we encourage that. So, but uh, yes, we, we make a point of integrating quickly with student organizations or those type of things. Yeah, same, same here. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, planning and study abroad, but could you say something more about how, whether study abroad ha happens and how often it happens? Oh, it's a great great question. At the U, the traditional study abroad semester in science and engineering is a thing of the past. Everything, I'm not saying it can't happen, and we actually have two full-time people in my office that just focus on engineering and science programs. The more common program is a short-term program. So we take three weeks in May. I take a group to Tanzania every January, coincidental time of year near the equator. Uh, uh, and, and these programs are technical elective credit programs. And uh, they fill it's not a whole semester. So. No, just, and so, and, and the other thing is that we, we tell our students that we have what's called a rule of 3220. They think they're full-time students. They're only in school 32 weeks a year. So what you do the other 20 weeks is probably as important, not more important than what they do in class. So, you know, they use every inter interstitial space, right? So they like May term. We, do, we have a lot of students traveling right now for three weeks in May term. They can come back and still have a full paid internship for the summer. Uh, we take them in January term for three weeks. Turns out the way that you works, another quirk, you don't have to pay tuition if you go January term because the credits get thrown out of the spring term. So it's free tuition wise. So these programs are growing tremendously. So we now take, we have a freshman course, we take freshmen overseas to five last year to five different countries. Unfortunately, that program tends to be wired toward families with means, so we have to raise some scholarship support. But, so we basically have a faculty member in the first year course who then goes with 20 students to Italy. Works on, say, global climate change in Venice or some, some such thing. But they're getting much more common, but they're rarely, it's very difficult to go over, to go anywhere for a semester and actually match the curriculum that our students, it's, our faculty are just not, very flexible. Yes. yes. <laughs> Alex, can you speak to this? Yeah, yeah yes. Um, I, I wanted to mention that we uh, do have uh, three uh, programs uh, in the engineering school, not Dartmouth. Dartmouth has its own programs for study abroad. And uh, we have arrangements with um, the uh, uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong, Technical University of Denmark, and also Chula Kong. Uh, sorry, Chula Longhorn University in Thailand. Uh, but as uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, there are some practical difficulties in doing that because Dartmouth is on a quarter system, and uh, it's not always easy to make uh, uh, one's program mesh uh, with a foreign semester-based uh, uh, system. Uh, and also, we've had uh, reports, anecdotal reports, that uh, students find that in some of those institutions, not all by, by all means, 
uh, the, the rigor is a very uh, different. The, uh, the level at which the courses are taught are different. And uh, that in and of itself would not be a problem because the students are quite happy to go for an easy mark. But uh, they sometimes have difficulties uh, keeping up with the rest of their students in some of the courses that serve as prerequisites for other courses. They'll find that some topics have not been covered adequately. But uh, uh, I, I don't mean to disparage the, the, the foreign uh, study program, but it's just anecdotal um, uh, reports that we've had. But uh, yes, we do have uh, a few uh, arrangements. They are not, um, uh, they do not involve many students because each of those universities will have a memorandum of uh, understanding uh, for exchanges both ways of three students, three from there and three from here, uh, for any one year. So that's a total of nine students for uh, any given uh, academic year. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, that the third school of engineering is probably uh, far smaller than the other schools that we had here uh, in this time. We have several study abroad programs. It is problematic for dual degree students to, to do it. Uh, we often encourage them to do it while they're at their uh, study abroad at their uh, affiliated school, their small liberal arts school. Uh, we do have several international experiences. Our Engineers Without Borders uh, last several years has gone to Ethiopia over winter break. Our chemical engineers have gone to Beijing to study air quality and so on and so forth over the summer. Lots of possibilities in that regard. Well, I think somehow, for the first time, okay. I have one more question, and it's for you, Ron, but uh, maybe I can understand if you don't want to answer. You said that 96 students for this year, meaning in the fall? Come yeah, we'll have a little bit of melt. Uh, that's how yeah. we've deposited, so we'll probably lose a hand. Right? Okay. Yes. And then, of the three two arrangements that you have, it's also about that figure? With how many institutions you had said earlier? Uh, what, yeah, I guess it is the same number. We have, I yeah. believe it's 96. We have 96 affiliated schools right now across the country. That's right. So what is the number of those 96 students sure. that come from? Yeah. Uh, last uh, year, 62 schools were represented uh, throughout <coughs> all the students who were, were there. So. Um, it, it's interesting because we do some, I have one school that has eight students coming this year, and then I have other schools that there hasn't been someone come for maybe over 10 years. And, and so we are very relationship-based. Myself or folks from our office actually do visit the campuses, and we always look at fit. It always comes back to is it the right fit for the student between the school and Washington University. And if there is a point where we certainly don't want to be affiliated just to put on an admissions brochure, to be honest with you. And there, that may be happening with some schools, uh, not very often, but um, uh, if, if we haven't had someone come for a while, then we'll have the conversation, maybe this shouldn't be an affiliation. Well, we uh, magically are out of time for the first time <laughs> today. Uh, I want to thank our panelists for joining us. Uh, it's been really helpful to have you all here and to hear your insights. And Alex, I'll follow up with you, but thank you so much for being here. I know you probably have to run. Thank you. I'll be signing off. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye. So maybe about a five minute break and then we'll have one more discussion before the session.